I'm Peter Tatchell. Welcome to this session, How to Right Wrongs. I think a good place to start is to remind ourselves that until 1999, Britain had by volume the largest number of anti-gay laws of any country in the world, some of them dating back centuries. By 2013, um, those laws, all the major anti-gay laws, had been repealed. Now that is an astonishing achievement. In that short space of time, all these historic anti-gay laws, or at least all the major ones, were repealed. And of course, the culmination was the legislation of equal marriage in 2013. Um, if we look at how that was achieved, it was through a combination of both uh, external outsider protest and direct action by groups like Outrage, and then also by insider parliamentary lobbying and uh, legal cases bought by Stonewall. Those two tactics worked in tandem, a bit like the suffragettes and the suffragettes. Both were needed, both were necessary. Um, if we look at the outrage campaigns, for example, around the age of consent, uh, outrage organized um, teenage kiss-ins and turn-ins where young people below the lawful age of this consent for gay and bisexual men um, stage kiss-ins and confess to having same-sex relations uh, contrary to the law, effectively challenging the police to arrest them. Um, and then, as a result of those protests, there was a huge amount of media coverage. And on top of that, uh, of course, it generated a huge public debate. And that raised public awareness and put the authorities under pressure to change. And then off the back of that, Stonewall lobbied members of parliament and the government, and indeed brought legal cases in the British and European courts. So that eventually, finally, the combination of those two tactics resulted in the law being changed and the age of consent be equalized at 16 for everyone in 2001. Having said all that, there are still inequalities today. You know, we have made enormous progress, but there are still some, I suppose, compared to the past, relatively minor uh, inequalities in the law. Uh, when it comes to blood donations, for example, uh, gay and bisexual men are still not allowed to um, donate blood if they've had sex with a person of the same sex in the preceding three months. Um, now that is based on a stereotypical generalization about uh, same-sex behavior. The idea or the thinking behind this is that gay and bisexual men are at higher risk of HIV and other sexual infections. But of course, some are, and they should not donate blood but others are not. Others are in long-term monogamous relationships. They've tested HIV negative. There's no reason why they shouldn't give blood. So the push really now is to move from this three month deferral period to a policy of individual assessment where each individual, regardless of their sexuality or gender identity, is required to answer more detailed questions about their sexual behavior to establish their risk factors. So what we're saying is test the blood, not the sexuality. Another outstanding issue is the fact that all the equality laws, fantastic though they are, have some limited qualified exemptions for religious organizations. Not just places of worship, but also faith-run schools, hospitals, nursing homes, shelters for the homeless, and so on. In certain circumstances, they are permitted to discriminate against LGBT plus people 
either in their employment policy or in the provision of services if they can establish a case that it is necessary to maintain their religious ethos. Now, no other institution in our society has such exemptions. Um, this is completely and totally unique. And my view is that religious organizations should not be above the law, but they should be required to conform to the equality statutes in the same way as everyone else. We also have the problem that the Gender Recognition Act, which was pioneering and progressive in 2004, um, is now outdated. Um, it has far too many hurdles and obstacles to trans people getting a legal change in their affirmed gender. Um, the government did promise reform under Theresa May, but that has effectively been kicked into the long grass under Boris Johnson. So it still is an issue for trans people. Um, they don't want to, understandably, to have to go through all these ho medical hoops and hurdles to be able to affirm their gender identity in legal documents. Um, we also have the ongoing issue of uh, the difficulty of LGBT plus refugees seeking asylum and securing it. Um, the rate of refusal for LGBT plus refugees is much higher than for political, religious or ethnic refugees. And a lot of it boils down to the fact of the difficulty of establishing or proving one sexuality or gender identity. But even where that can be proven through documents and personal affidavits from people who know the person who's seeking asylum, still the rate of refusal is very, very, very high. And this is really heartbreaking because some LGBT plus refugees who fled serious persecution where they are at risk of imprisonment or even execution are sometimes sent back to those countries where their lives and liberty is in danger. So the asylum system does need reform, and I might add, not just for LGBT plus refugees, but for all refugees, because currently it is biased and weighted against genuine applicants. And the final issue I'd raise is, of course, we have same-sex marriage, but it is not true marriage equality, because it is under a separate law, the 19, uh, the uh, uh, 2013 law, rather than under the main marriage law, the 1949 Marriage Act. So having a separate law is not equality. And moreover, there is a lock in place in this law which prevents the Church of England from conducting same-sex marriages, even if it wishes to. So even if the Church of England decided that it would agree to conduct same-sex marriages in its place of worship, the law prohibits the church from doing that. And that is an attack upon religious freedom as well as discrimination. So these are some ongoing wrongs that need to be put right. Looking at the overall issue, I think, um, we have made some progress. After a big campaign nearly a decade ago, or about a decade ago, um, the government did issue a public apology to gay and bisexual men for the historic persecution they had faced under anti-gay laws. That was a really big, important step. Um, and then a bit later, again under pressure from campaigners like myself and many others, uh, the government agreed to introduce a pardon system to pardon men who had been um, convicted under these laws. Now, the problem is that the way the pardon scheme is working is not effective and not fair. Um, the last figures that I saw showed that about two thirds of men who'd applied for a pardon had been refused. Now it's true the pardon scheme does only apply 
to men who were convicted for behaviour that is no longer a crime today. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.